I'm most pleased to join with all of you this morning at this meeting to bring to you the greetings and the expressions of solidarity of my fellow U.S. trade unionists. I express my regret that I can't deliver my remarks in Spanish, but I noticed that all of you are listening. All of you are listening without translating, so I feel better. I want to express also my appreciation to Joe Rico and Andy Val Cabrera, Pepe Curiat, and all of the others, and all of you who maintain this organization and keep the voice of Fleet Cuba alive. I'm currently the chairman of the Committee for Free Trade Unionism, a US based group that is rooted in the belief that there can be no free trade unions without democracy and no democracy without free trade unions. My friend Jack Otero, my friend and brother Jack Otero, who is here, is also a member of that committee. The dictators in nations such as Cuba, China, Vietnam, and others see the unions of their nation as creatures of the ruling party, as transmission belts for party programs, and as vehicles for increasing productivity by making workers labor harder and faster for less. Indeed, in a May Day speech just two weeks ago, Salvador Valdez Mesa, the head of the Cuban Confederation, urged workers to work harder and increase their efficiency. That was his principal message for May Day. Our committee sees trade unions as the only vehicle by which workers themselves can seek to improve their working conditions and the lives of their families. Our U.S. unions have been advocates for workers in other lands and consistent supporters of democracy development all around the world for more than a century. We have never wavered from our opposition to exploitation and to the imposition of any kind of governmental control which deprives workers of their rights. Two years ago, our committee ran a petition drive in the United States to add U.S. Union voices to the many others calling for the release and the exoneration of the trade unionists, journalists, and others who were swept up in the Black Spring of 2003, and all the other prisoners of conscience suffering in Castro's jails. Fidel ignored our pleas. Now, we're organizing a similar drive to press Raul and to test again whether his promises of change go beyond cosmetic changes in the economy. Sadly, I fear that we all know the eventual outcome of that effort. But also we know we must continue to try, both for the prisoners and for the world, so that it has held before it evidence of the intolerance of the Cuban dictatorship and the weapons it uses to suppress any dissent. It seems to me that the work of our committee, the work of years, is increasingly important in a world in which so many of our unions and other organizations seem too occupied with other matters and too often forgetful of the plight of Cuban workers. In a recent meeting of 80 union representatives from the European Union and from Latin America, the leaders adopted a fine statement on all the things that should be done to perfect trade and economic relations between the two areas. But they had little time for Cuba. Indeed, the only time that Cuba was mentioned in a four-page communique was in one sentence which condemned the U.S. economic embargo and a second one protesting against violations of human rights and trade union rights in Colombia, Guatemala, and any other country. So in the polite and the statesmanlike language of this day, Cuba and its workers, its persecuted and jailed trade unionists, became any other country. Raul Castro 
has now moved to relieve in very small ways the burdens of some government regulation. But to ensure that there would be no mistake in his intentions, he has at the same time moved to strengthen the Communist Party structure and its hold on the economy and has called for another party conference in October to solidify that party's power and control. And lest anyone think that allowing the sale of a few computers and cell phones signals a more humane society, he has strengthened the government's efforts to control the internet and stifle any ideas of relaxation of control and even refuse to allow the creator of the block Generation Y to go to Spain to accept an award. Your work in gears is to be applauded, and your efforts to convince corporations doing business in Cuba need to be supported. The corporations operating in free nations around the world, many of them nations that have known the terrors of dictatorship, need to be pressed to do everything in their power to alleviate the conditions of workers in China. These corporations supply much needed business activity and jobs in Cuba, but they should also insist on being able to employ workers in ways which don't violate the norms set by the international labor organization, norms that the Cuban government pretends to support. And those companies should press the government for a rationalization of employment policies. If and it is a very large if. If there is any further opening to allow new investment in Cuba, this organization can be critically important in ensuring responsible conduct by any new entrants into the Cuban economy. Investment which creates jobs is vitally necessary, but they must not be created in ways which will allow only those who are favored by the regime to gain employment, even though at low wages, while the state continues to rake off the benefits of dollar and euro and other currency investments. Those prospective new investors will have the bargaining power to insist on fair and decent treatment of workers if they have the will to do so. And this organization must continue to encourage them to develop that will. And when the U.S. economic embargo is lifted in response to Cuban government acts to permit the development of democratic processes and to allow Cuban workers their right to free trade unions independent of the state, we will happily join with Pierce in pressing American investors to insist on the observance of ILO standards and to treat Cuban workers and their free and democratic unions with decency and fairness. There is not yet good news from Cuba, but I'm convinced that your continuing efforts of those of countless others pressing for freedom and democracy and a decent way of life for working people will, in the end, prevail. The Cuban dictatorship, like so many others before it, will fall. And the Cuban people will again enjoy the benefits of the society that they will create. Thank you for inviting me, for allowing us to participate with you in the continuing efforts to restore democratic rights to the Cuban people. Thank you.